Uh, yeah, let's get stuck into it. There's nothing like the first person end up being behind and then perhaps everyone runs behind. So um, I would just like to begin by acknowledging my co-authors, Patricia Cullen, Cynthia Brown, Kelsey Hegarty and, and Professor Alison Hutchinson, as well as the Alive National Centre for Mental Health Research Translation, who uh, provided some seed funding for the second phase of this project I'm going to speak to you about. But before we do get into it, I would like to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the lands of the Wadawurrung peoples down here on the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present, and to all of the tra traditional custodians here on the lands. Um, I do recognise that I'm a visitor here and I appreciate the opportunity to do my work and to live on these lands. So before I speak about the actual strategies that I'm here to talk to you about today, uh, where you may be able to provide some support to researchers who are exploring sensitive topics, I do want to provide, I guess, a little bit of a... Um, uh, background or just set the scene. And so the majority of you probably know about secondary stress and vicarious trauma, but a brief overview. Um, often acute in nature, secondary stress uh, refers to the emotional and psychological distress experienced by individuals who are indirectly exposed to traumatic events through their work or relationships with those who have di directly themselves experienced trauma or a traumatic event. And the impact of that secondary stress commonly mirrors what it's like for the person who originally experiences the trauma. So that might be things like anxiety and depression and perhaps um, distancing them themselves. Um, Vicarious trauma, though, is a little bit different and um, a little bit more serious. And it's recognised as an issue where individuals um, internalise the emotional and psychological effects of trauma narratives they encounter. And it leads to changes in their worldview in particular, their self-perceptions and sometimes in their relationships. And in the context of researchers studying sensitive topics, Vicarious trauma can develop as researchers really immerse themselves into the participants' stories and witness those profound effects um, that, you know, multiple forms of trauma and adversity can bring about and often find it really hard to forget or move on from those narratives. So those sensitive topic researchers themselves might start to experience things like hypervigilance or Conversely, some emotional numbing, increased suspicion, cynicism, and so forth. Um, so, sorry, I, I've, I've just realised my video isn't on. I do apologise. Is that better? Yeah. No. We were, listening, love... we were listening intently, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Not that I love people seeing my face. I should have ignored that. <laughs> um, so... Why am I doing this study? I guess what I need to, um, probably what I need to share is that it was really my experiences as a PhD student um, and I guess being quite emotionally distressed by the content that I was um, hearing, by what I was seeing um, and and what I was feeling in, in that research. And um, that spurred me into action, not just because that was what I was experiencing, but because my fellow group of, of PhD students were all kind of experiencing the same thing. Admittedly, we were working in the areas of gendered violence and abuse. Um, and I, I just wanted to see, you know, is that a broader experience or is, or is it more limited to our area? So last year I did a bit of a love project, you know, one of those projects where you've got no money, no workload allocation, but you're going to do it anyway. And I interviewed 42 Australian researchers from across the country. Um, and what I found there was that most researchers are really having a, well, a poor experience um, in their research journey. And it's really surprising that we're often able to even keep them. Um, so then I applied for an Alive um, seed grant. And um, and from there, I was able to uh, run some co-design workshops so that we could develop some resources so other stakeholders can help researchers to actually get through that journey um, with the sensitive topics that they are. So although I'm actually going to 
focus on the, the second phase today, I just want to quickly take you through the results of the first phase because they do speak to the second phase as well. Um, so the first phase interviews, the, the 42 interviews that we did, that really showed us that most researchers in this area feel like they're being thrown into the deep end, regardless of how much preparation they they did to, um, you know, in the lead up to their research. Many of them felt that it was an absolute horror show once they were in there and really immersing themselves in that data, that there were some things there that they would never be able to unhear or unsee. And because of the, the nature of it and the fact that it was a constant kind of building on top of each other and, and constant exposure, some of them expressed that they either felt like it was killing them or it was killing any chance that they would be able to continue in this research for very long. So... We asked them about their experiences, but we also asked them about what kind of support that they were getting. And unfortunately, it seemed that most researchers are really being failed in this work. Um, they're experiencing many barriers to accessing support, including not even knowing what support's available. There's a lot of issues within the culture of, of academia. You're expected to just move on and not being impacted by the work that you're doing. Um, they went into academia thinking that there would actually be a shared responsibility for researcher um, protection. I guess they thought that supervisors and managers and their faculties and schools would take care of them in that space and then realise that that's not actually happening. And yeah, they were unable to actually find any support, whether it was within the institution or externally, because a lot of um, counselling and psychological support they tried to access wasn't really trauma informed. Um, so what happened then was that they're actually doing it all for themselves and and that meant that um, they were trying to make up for those systems failures so there was a lot of escapism and and, and maladaptive coping behaviors trying to understand personal limits um or you know what was what would tip them overboard they did notice that um that to be able to be positive and, and have gratitude for their own positioning um, often disrupted some of the negative impacts. And they were really good at um, doing a lot of self-care strategies. So um, I guess that moves us into why we did the phase two results, uh, well, the phase two of this study. And that is because we felt that, okay, researchers are saying that they're unsupported and they do feel that there is room for other uh, stakeholders to be able to provide support. So the first part of the um, seven co-design workshops that we did over three phases identified to us that the stakeholders that they really felt could play a role were um, not just individual researchers themselves, but HREX, supervisors and managers, funding bodies, schools and faculties, and also graduate researcher schools. Now, what we found during this time was really interesting because there is a huge perception by researchers, particularly early career to mid-career researchers, that ethics committee, committees are there to protect them as much as they're there to protect uh, research participants and, and to, I guess, judge the merit of, of the research and so forth. Um, what they are very unaware of is that although we are expected to really keep a close eye on, on um, risk to individual participants and, and um, to groups and families and so forth, there isn't such a responsibility for an ethics committee to actually, you know, really think about the researcher risk. And ultimately, that is probably more up to the, to the actual um, research teams themselves. We know, those of us that are sitting on ethics committees, so probably most of us here, that we don't have the capacity to do all that work. It would probably be lovely if we could, but we don't actually have the capacity, nor does the, the national statement actually require us to really focus on that area. But what I see as being a potential, and, and someone referred earlier to that Goldilocks moment of being in the middle of, hey, this is the expectation, this is reality, maybe we can meet here, is that perhaps ethics committees can actually use their role, which is quite influential with research teams, to actually encourage research teams to think about what they can do and how they can assess risk so that those early career, mid career, or even perhaps um, lived experience researchers are protected a little bit more when they're doing sensitive topics. So what 
we developed a few resources because we know that also that HREX, they don't have time to develop their own resources. And we thought, well, if we can develop some templates, then we can pass them on to HREX and say, here you go. If you want to use it, great. Thanks for being an advocate for, for researchers who engage in sensitive topics. So the first one that we um, developed was it's basically a script or a prompt that HREX can simply give out to research teams who are, you know, um, applying for ethics through their through their HREC. And it all it really says is, you know, um, research of secondary stress and, and vicarious trauma is important to us. And we just can, you know, would you consider assessing the risk within your own team? Here's a couple of strategies you might want to use. And it's about assessing risk. It's about creating a plan, providing opportunities for debriefing, encouraging the researchers to engage in self-care and checking in on team members who might be early to mid-career research or lived experience researchers. Uh, we did actually develop, and this took a lot, a lot of work, a uh, risk um, assessment template. And so this is where uh, research teams, not, not ethics committees, it's, it's above and beyond your role to do this, but it, research teams could actually get together and talk about how risky the project is and then assess the risk and implement, uh, I guess, strategies depending on where they had assessed their risk. So to do that, of course, we had to come up with risk ratings and guidance, um, you know, so what would be a likely event within a study and how much of an impact that would have. You'll see here that we have actually put together a whole document on this on um, actually providing information about occurrence and severity, what that could mean what the risk assessment matrix itself looks like. We then offer some strategies there for, okay, you're low risk. So that doesn't mean you still wouldn't do things like individual wellbeing plans, vicarious trauma training, peer debriefing and monthly team check-ins. If you ended up being moderate risk, you would do everything in the low risk, but you would also add in things like regular, regular structured team debriefing. And down the bottom there, we have some examples of how it would be used and it gives some scenarios that, you know, a, a team perhaps has one researcher who's doing 12 to 30 interviews all by themselves and where that actually puts them at risk and what they can do to help that researcher. Another thing that we developed just was, um, you know, something that that supervisors or chief investigators can use with their team. And this is another thing that HREX could just give out to, to research teams. And it's where that CI could sit down with their team and say, you know, okay, so what are some of the triggers or warning signs that you're being impacted by the work you're doing? Um, what can you do for yourself to keep yourself mentally healthy? Is it taking breaks? Is it, you know, making sure you go for a walk after work? Um, and what could we as your managers or supervisors or colleagues do to prevent and respond if you are being impacted by the research you're doing? And before I finish up, I just wanted to say that there are actually some resources out there that do exist for researchers. Um, there is a researcher resilience community of practice here in Australia. We also have the ASSERT network that's only been recently established, but it is there for researchers who just want to share information or get a little bit of, um, I guess, encouragement to in the work that they're doing. There's also a researcher wellbeing plan template that's been developed by um, Skinner over at Bath University. University. I encourage people to have a look at that. And the Sexual Violence Research Initiative have developed a dare to care um, whole training package on vicarious trauma. And finally, we are launching all of these resources with all the ones that we've done for the funders and, and all the rest next month. And if anyone would like to join us, you are more than welcome. You can scan the QR code there. And that's it from me. Thank you so much, Renee. And you can see online um, it has sparked some conversation here around um, whose responsibility uh, is it. So in the interest of time, I think we continue the chat. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, an, it, it's interesting. I think, you know, personally I go back to one of your earlier comments just around saying that the HREX responsibility is to the participants but also to, um, you know, protecting the researchers as well and you know look there's no harm in asking these questions but do acknowledge some of the conversation that is occurring in the chat um, and you might see also that it's going to be different across institutions and where their supports and things are um, but you know certainly 
personal experience is that it's often a one-liner, what are the risks in this project? Um, and, and maybe there is appetite for more prompts around what some of those risks might be. So thanks very much for your um, comprehensive Thank you so much. Um, presentation and please continue in that chat because it has it, you've got almost another research study starting off in the chat right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker, and that is Gudrun uh, Wells, and he's going to present on our second topic today, which is beyond the form, what types of communication with clinical trial with clinical research participants need ethical review. Um, and I apologize if I didn't get your name um, perfect there. Please correct me. Uh, I am very used to people uh having lots of interesting pronunciations of my name. Um, thank you very much, Kim. Um, I am talking today about a Godrun. project. Sorry, Godrun. We can see, uh, you need to change over to, um, we can see your presentation notes slides.